Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be kind of hosting tonight. And tonight's speaker is Joshua Flynn, candidate for the State House. And um, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. One, we have one pool at a time. Two, there's no personal attacks. The College of the Complexes consists of the following format. One, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then we will have our speaker. Then we will have a question and answer period. It's asked to ask questions during the question period and not make statements. Because after the question and answer period, you have a chance to rebut. The speaker gets the last word. We have to be out by 8.45 out of the restaurant because they close at 9. It's Joshua Flynn. He's running for the Libertarian for Illinois State House District 78. Joshua Flynn is a vibrant, energetic, experienced champion of the underserved in his community. For over a decade, Flynn has been an organizer, activist, mentor, and conduit of resources, creating opportunities and making an impactful difference in the lives of others. Joshua Flynn is running for the Office of State Representative in 78th District in the state of Illinois to represent and champion the needs of his community. District 78, home to over 108,000 residents, is located in the city of Chicago and includes Layden, Oak Park, and Proviso Townships, the five villages of Elmwood Park, Franklin Park, Melrose Park, Oak Park, and River Grove. Restoring integrity to our local government is a prime focus for Flynn. At the financial level, he seeks to bring better oversight to both budget and spending and believes that attention and pension and tax program needs solid, thoughtful reform. At every level, he, pretend, he plans to bring greater transparency to the government. Let's give a warm, rousing round of applause to Joshua Flynn. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you guys for having me here at the College of Complexes. Uh, my name is Joshua Flynn. I'm running for state representative of the 78th District. Uh, my father, my husband, um, I live in the Austin community, which is the west side of Chicago. Uh, born and raised in the Austin community. Uh, I'm a business consultant. I work with non for profits in Austin and the surrounding areas of Chicago as well. <clears throat> Look about my campaign. I'm a lower tax guy. Economic liberation and safer streets. That's my biggest focus. With lower taxes, we can bring in newer jobs. Uh, with that, also, we can bring in constituent based businesses for the economic base of our communities. I believe also with a working class community, we have a safer community. Kids in school is a safer community across Chicago. That's what I believe in. And that's my campaign. And that's why I'm running for state representative of the 78th district. That's all your that's all. Okay. Do we want to bring a moderator to answer questions? Yeah, we can have a question. Why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit about your platform and what you stand for? Sure, like I said, well, my platform is lower taxes, economic liberation, and safer streets. Um, basically, in our community, we have the high, one of the highest crime rates in the city of Chicago. Actually, it is the highest crime rate in the city of Chicago. Um, the resources are not there. We need to bring back the resources to my community on the west side of Chicago, as well as the south side of Chicago as well. That's my biggest focus across Austin, across the state of Illinois. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, what area is this where the highest crime rate is? It's the Austin community. It's the western part of the city. Austin. Austin. It's the divide between Cicero to, Cicero to the east, Austin and Harlem to the west, to the south is Roosevelt, and to the north is the Grand Court. Have you been involved in your community? Yes. Can you give us some examples? Sure. Well, Northwest Austin Council, I'm the core director there, where we do a block of organizing across the Austin community. Uh, basically, we bring together safer communities by organizing different block clubs throughout Austin community. What about some turkey thing at Thanksgiving? Say that again? Were you the guy that was giving away turkeys at Thanksgiving or something? No, I wasn't. No. Did, who are you challenging and why are you a libertarian? Uh, what do you think is different from libertarian versus Democrat or Republican? Well, with Republican, there was no outreach in my community. They don't, they don't show up to our community. They don't come out and speak to anyone. There's no face of the Republican Party. The Democratic Party has been there for over 50 years. And my community is still a mess. There's no transparency amongst that party whatsoever. And all they do is utilize our votes and, and basically damage my community. That's what my community is right now. It's damage. Right now. Could I ask, uh, 
who is representing the district now, and why do you feel that you are a better candidate than that person? Sure. It's Camille Wild Lily. What? Camille Wild Lily. That's the candidate. That's the candidate. Camille Lily? Yes. The reason why I'm a better candidate, I believe I'm a better candidate, because I'm going to show the transparency to our community. I'm going to bring those resources back to Austin where they deserve to be so my community can thrive. As of right now, they're not thriving at all. You have the highest unemployment rate, higher than the national average right now in Austin, which is 19%. We need to bring that back down in Austin. That's why I would bring those resources to bring, the, bring those numbers back down. That's why I'm a better candidate for second district. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Flint, where can you stand do you up? stand on the graduated income tax amendment that we're all going to be voting for in November of 2020? Some are calling it the blank check amendment because it gives our politicians a blank check. Where do you stand on this? Should we vote in favor of this amendment or should we vote against it? We should vote against it. Don't vote against it altogether. I'm um, for a flat tax across Illinois. I was going to ask the other day about on the national level, the federal level. Yeah, I would vote for it to be on the federal level as well for a flat tax. Yes. That's good to know. Thank you, sir. Okay. Does your neighborhood have good schools? No, they don't. We have a lot of school closings in Austin, actually. Right now, with Austin High School, Douglas High School, right now, at one time, Austin High School had 2,500 students. Right now, we're less than 200 students in Austin. The resources in that high school is gone. With Douglas, Douglas High School as well, we're down to 96 students in Douglas High School. So yeah, we lost, we lost a lot of schools in an awesome community. Was that because of population, demographics, or just uh, underutilization of resources in your community? Yeah, like the resources. The resources are not there to help those students out. And the communication between the teacher, the, the teacher, the student, and the parents are not there as well. But. You know, Mr. Flynn, uh, on Thursday, the state of Illinois is going to enact an increase in the minimum wage. Um, I believe so, and which should, some say should be around $30, $33. But the Libertarians unilaterally, unilaterally oppose this. Are you opposed to consider earning more uh, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me an increase let me, in the minimum wage? Yeah, I don't believe an increase into $30 an hour. Let me explain why. The minimum, minimum wage was meant to be a starter position, a starter job. You have jobs that make $30 an hour right now with very high skilled people. Now you have to increase their pay, which is going to hurt the business owners to try to pay that at higher wages. No, I do not believe in higher wages, minimum wage being that high. It's a starter position. It's to get your experience, then move on. More likely, you're going to move up into a higher position, which is going to pay more in the future. Follow up? Yes. At least 50% or more of the people earning minimum wage are middle aged or better. They're not kids. It's not starting out that people in the employees of uh, fast food restaurants are not kids. It's not starting a starting job. This is their income. And in restaurants, that's their primary occupation. Those fast food restaurants were meant for college students. Like I said, it was meant for starter jobs. A lot of people that start those positions sometimes get they get lack lazy in those positions and stay there. But like I said, those positions was never meant to be there forever. It was meant to move up into management. You've been there for if you say you've been there for five years, you're gonna learn the position that you're in. You should have grown into a management position, which would have gave you a higher increase in wages outside of the wage itself. But like I say, a lot of people get they get stuck in those ruts where they get used to those positions, which is actually hurting the economy because they're not growing in the community. Okay, who's next? Uh, you're in a community, you lack resources, it's down and out. How do you fix that? Not, uh, yeah, that's what you need. How do you, how do you, how are you going to bring resources to your community, especially in a state that's uh, virtually <coughs> on bankruptcy? You cut back and overspend. Overspending will cut back, it will be in the prison systems where the overall population in prisons itself. We cut back in there, we have the money to put towards those resources for those communities that need those resources. It's like Austin or Inglewood or like, you know, like Belleville, Illinois, Champaign, Rockford. It's those communities are lacking those because of the prison system. It's just the overcrowding, the overspending on the prison system and over policers in our community, especially in my community, over policing. 
How do you feel about uh, Can you stand, uh, please? the Illinois Constitution? How do you feel uh, about uh, an amendment to the Illinois Constitution to allow for reforms to the current pension system? Say it again. Do you support amending the, the Illinois Constitution to allow for reforms to the pension system? Just watch her Well, stack. Like what, here in Illinois, you have the politicians that get a pension, which I don't believe they should get a pension at all. Then you have uh, the pension system is is damaged here. They have they have stolen so much money from the pension system; it's, it's corrupted. What I believe should happen with the reform is. Everybody that has been promised a pension should get their pension. Going forward, what we should do is counsel the pension and structure a 401k as much stronger for those workers across the state. And counsel all pensions all together, especially for politicians in Illinois. You mentioned uh, politicians' uh, uh, pensions. Uh, how have double, triple dipping affected the, uh, uh, has affected the, State budget. You see that? What do you mean? Explain it to me. Oh, uh, so example. Uh, for example, you, uh, uh, Davis. He was uh, alderman, commissioner, representative. He's getting three different pensions, right? Correct. Uh, even the ones that are paid for by the state. Uh, you know, pensioners. You know, usually get way more than paid in, and these guys are getting multiple pensions. Um, I don't even know if that's really a question as more as that. What are your want, thoughts on, on, on that? Well, it shouldn't be, because like you say, David, that's my congressman, actually. So when he retires, he gets a pension from the city of Chicago, he gets a pension from the Cook County, from the county, because he was a county commissioner, and then he gets a pension from the Fed. When he retires, he probably, his pension will probably be almost a quarter of a million dollars, just in pension alone. That's not even 401k, that's not anything else he has to decide. Um, that's why I say all politicians should not receive pensions at all. But well, well, that's how worked hard for it, right? <laughs> yeah, in my community, that's the way it still looks. Yeah. The, you're running for a state office for being state senator. Do you see yourself interacting at all with the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot? Say that again? Uh, you're running for a state office. You, you're running for state senator. Do you state see, representative. State representative, I'm sorry. Uh, do you see yourself uh, interacting, let's say, if you were to win the election, do you see yourself interacting with Lori Lightfoot? Yes. Actually, not just Lori Lightfoot as well, as well as uh, the other, I have six all, six mayors, actually, in my district. Actually, I sent out letters uh, back in October to those mayors, giving a response back. But yes, I look forward to working with them as well. Okay. See how we can co-op things to work together across the state. So, yes. Lori Lightfoot comes to the state um, of Illinois asking for a bailout or asking for some help, what, what, how will you vote? I'll vote against it, yes. Lori Lightfoot wants to take our, take the, the pension, Chicago's pension, and dump it on the state of Illinois. Yes. I don't believe tax, taxpayers should be dealing with another bill that's not theirs to begin with. Okay. All right. You're, you work, you'll represent part of Franklin Park, right? Yes. Yeah. Small portion of Franklin Park, yes. All right. Uh, what do you what do you intend to do about excessive freight train traffic going through the town at rush hour, particularly between the hours of like, uh, five, you know, when commuters are using a metro rail and there's a freight train sitting there for about 45 minutes sometimes as they're trying to disembark and, and go on to commuter trains. I don't know too much about this subject. I used to work in that rail yard that you're talking about. The Bensonville rail yard? Yeah, the BNSS. That's BNS, uh, BNSF. Yeah, that's, was it Norfolk or was it? Uh, it's it's the one on the main line there. Belmont, correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, on Belmont. Well, like I said, I don't know too much about that. I have to look into it and see. I get back to you. I'll let you know. Yeah, um, because I too worked in that yard for a while, and uh, I did a lot of deliveries to that yard. I had oh. one trucking company. Yes. Wow. What 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 are your thoughts though on uh, the, the 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 toll road expending itself on the Green Street down there? To the Green Street? Yeah, there's there's a, a whole new construction going on from toll road with the extension of the uh, Elgin O'Hare Expressway to O'Hare and then plans for 294 new route on 294 with an exit on Green Street to link up the uh, expressways are you familiar with the toll road construction going on in your district um well that's actually outside my district like I said I have to, look, I have to get back to you with that I don't know too much about the toll road expansion there 
Again, we're talking, you're talking a lot about traffic congestion and reduction and all that stuff going to be done by 2025. Um, what about bus routes from like the... Uh, How many questions do you get? <laughs> <laughs> more got, we, got, we got some time, Charlie, so go ahead and blast away. <laughs> go ahead and blast away. Who's next, please? I wanted to ask about, uh, to ask about uh, what's your plan for economic inclusion predominantly for African Americans who have yet to achieve uh, any uh, equality in the state of Illinois and, and uh, essentially in the country? Economic inclusion. I like to use economic liberation because uh, the inclusion, we include it right now, but everybody's eating. I'm not eating right now, but I'm included in this conversation. Um, the liberation part piece I, was, I like about it is being liberated is, is a free man. We're supposed to be a free man in our country. And uh, when it comes to economics in the black community across the state of Illinois, there is no freedom there in our communities. And I like to work with those communities to help free up the regulations that's holding them back from moving forward. And that's one of my goals. There. That's why it's a part of my platform as well. <coughs> Did I hear you say earlier that you're opposed to raising the minimum wage? Yeah. The minimum wage is like eight dollars an hour right now, or something like that. It is uh, eight. Uh, statewide, statewide is like eight, eight fifty. Did, did, have you seen the, uh, the survey that's been published over the last six months, off and on, but not covered by the media? That they colleges have done studies showing that a, a person working a forty-hour a week minimum wage job cannot afford to rent an apartment, a two-bedroom right. apartment, anywhere in this country. Yeah, going back. Yeah, so the minimum wage is basically a homeless shelter wage unless you're working two or three jobs. You gotta How would you address that? You gotta live in a dumpster. No, I live in a dumpster. Like I said, the minimum wage, we keep talking about it for people that are, are up in age. We talk about, you keep talking about for people that are, are skilled. No one's skilled will be making minimum wage. Wages. Um, like I said, minimum wage, more likely a person is living with someone that's making minimum wage. They're more likely they're a student majority of the time. I made minimum wage when I was 14 years old here in Chicago. I wasn't living with anybody, I was living with my parents. Uh, when I turned, when I was uh, 18 years old, I made more than minimum wage and didn't even have the skill for the job. I learned on the job for the position and made more than minimum wage. Um, yeah, I don't you know. Yeah. Mr. Flynn, there are all sorts of government programs such as Department of Labor training programs, HUD, housing development programs, uh, Department of Education programs for improving schools. But you disavow government and you want less taxes. I'd like to know what the free market is going to do to give those people jobs, better schools, and better housing. Where's the free market been in Austin? It hasn't been there because of regulations. Because of all these regulations that have been stopping my community from growing. We don't have constituent based businesses. Like I always say, we're more than just barbershop. We're more than just fried chicken restaurants. We are creatives. We are developers. We are architects. We are mechanics. We are grower of things. And because of regulations, my, my community has been shut down on actually having those constituent based businesses. They can't help lower taxes. Constituent based businesses lower your taxes in the state of Illinois. A lot of people don't know that. They always believe into the bigger corporations, but those smaller little companies that grow into your community will lower your taxes. So none of the multinational corporations, I'd like to know what regulations prevent the multinational corporations with their money right now have done for your community in the past 100 years. When they were there, they brought jobs. Because of regulations, they had to leave my community. Regulations? Yeah, because of regulations. License issues in my community. You know, just to get a liquor license in my community is fifteen thousand dollars. You put you put in the small people that's trying to get those liquor licenses, trying to get those businesses together out of business. I, yeah, as about the regulations more specifically with the I guess my theory as a former libertarian myself is that if you define free market just based on regulation and price, I mean, it sounds good in a theory, but is, is this fact-based, you know, or I, I question the economics. I, I recognize there's been disinvestment in 
the Austin community, as in the whole world. Um, but I, Austin. Yeah, specifically. I just, it, it's surprising for a liberty that the libertarian, I just don't see libertarians really dealing with inner city urban issues. I, you know, it seems more like a theory than a evidence-based economic reality that libertarians really will bring more resources back. Well, that's why I'm here. I'm in well, those areas. I'm in that community. Yes. Yeah. That's why I'm here. I'm here to bring those resources here. But, uh, the outreach came because the Libertarian Party came to my community. Like I said, the Republicans didn't come to my community. The Democrats are there, but what are they doing? They lack lazy. They're just sitting there. Well, can, what can they do? I mean, that's. I mean, what can a politician do um, in effect? Uh, well, can excuse me. <laughs> can get out can of I bed? answer? Mm -hmm. I think um, as the politicians, I like what, what Mr. Flynn is saying because in those areas, as far as safety goes, it's not happening. I know because I lost my son on the streets of Chicago. So for someone to come in with fresh new ideas, to want to work about safety, you get my vote. You get my vote. You get my vote. We haven't heard any new ideas. Oh, where were you? Hey, where were one you? bullet time, guys. Yeah. It's the new ideas I'm seeing. Um, no, so, yeah, no yeah. personal attacks. <laughs> so in like Austin, uh, in fact, I was just reading a a uh, local newspaper that said that a neighborhood group organization, Austin Coming Together, received like $10 million to invest into the community. In fact, there were uh, several articles written about neighborhood organizations that received funds from the government in order to help places like uh, Austin and Inglewood and so on and so forth. Um, but it just seems like those organizations aren't helping. Like, what are you going to do? as a uh, state rep in order to ensure that those individuals that's receiving funds from the government to put into our community are actually doing what they're supposed to do. I spoke about this before, oversight. We need an oversight to, un to understand where are the taxpayers' money going? Where is this being spent on? Is it being used properly? Is it being spent the correct way? And that's the oversight committee that we need in Springfield that we don't have. It's to oversee those things. I'd like to know what your stance is on term limits and what the philosophy is behind them. Uh, yeah, I'm for term limits. Um, I believe that we will phone Congress. I believe on term limits for Congress. A lot of them, they spend so much time in Congress. Like right now, they say that a congressman spends every every session his his uh, net worth here his or her net worth grows 2.1 million dollars each election cycle. That needs to change. There's no way a, a congressman should be. They should put the laws into place and go home. And be and be and be judged under those laws that they put in place. Yes, I own four term limits. Actually, I was endorsed by the United States term limits. Well, the guy who has first term I have a question. Uh, how do you feel, you know, as a um, black reparations? How do you feel about that? You know, Willie Wilson has promoted a lot of people. Austin have promoted back black reparations. Uh, how do you feel about that? Um, black reparations. We need reconciliation first before we start talking about reparations. Um, it's a lot of issues between the different the, the white and black community that's still going on today that we need to reconcile first before we start talking about reparations. We have a lot of uh, other issues going on. Um, but if you talk about reparations, you talking about like far as resources or you talking about actual funds given back to those individuals, a certain individual. I'm talking about more of the resources, uh, actually kind of both resources. So when you talk about black reparations, really you and my my term uh, is like giving back to the black community as in more entrepreneurships uh, when it comes to an Afro-American tax exemption you know stuff like that no I don't I don't I don't I guess I don't agree with that doing that like in that order like that um, reparations I can say reconciliation is my is my deal for, for us getting started with first before starting with, before we even have a conversation about reparations. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Flynn, I'd like to know. I'm, I've never seen a study on this, but can you tell me what year an elected official goes bad? Is the first year, the fifth year, the tenth year? The day he's born. <laughs> 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 
a serious answer. I'd like no, to that's know. a serious response. I'd like to know because if, if he's if he's if he gets if he's crooked in the office, he's been crooked all his life. They didn't just start. So all day, day he's been crooked since day one. Do all elected officials are crooked? No. Are all politicians crooked? No. Man, ain't how's the follow up? If it gets a term limit, we have an honest we guy like me, an honest guy in office, <laughs> and he, well, I won't be eligible to run. <laughs> And then again, you get, rid of the, you get rid of the honest guy, and you would be electing a, a fraud. So why is the system removed? Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? If I'm an honest elected official, and there's a term limit, I can't run again, and the chance, if the chance exists that the person who is elected is a crook. And I'd like to know how you're in favor of this and how it improves the, the legislature. You're in favor of bribing? If there's no guarantee that the next person elected will not be a crook. <laughs> right? The purpose of term limits is to keep the crooks out of here. How? It, how? Because they, like Nancy Pelosi, for instance, Nancy Pelosi is a, is a multi millionaire, multi millionaire politician. Hello. She controls so much. It's time for Nancy Pelosi to go home mm. and be judged under her laws that she put in place. Mm. Mm. What crime Nothing has changed since she's been in office. What was she changed? What crime has she been convicted of? Just wait. Mm. 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 By those who would say that the use of government to provide for those who can't provide for themselves is a necessity. That, and the idea that without the use of government, that those <coughs> impoverished or otherwise incapable people would starve to death. How do you reconcile the concept of libertarianism with humanitarianism. Yeah, good question. Well, you're going, you're going to have people that's going to use government services. You're going to have people that's on disability. They're going to have no choice but to use those services altogether. The working class people, there's people that are able are using the services is what we're totally against. Able-bodied person that's able to work a 40-hour job per week and be able to pay, you know, pay back to the society to be a Good, a good citizen of Chicago, Illinois, one of the countries of the United States, I believe that you know they should work. The problem is so many people are on those welfare systems and taken away from the ones that's on disability, taken away from the ones that actually need those services. And we need to stop it. Stop that unnecessary spending that we're doing. What is it, 500,000 people are gonna be removed from here just in Cook County alone off of uh, the welfare system because they are able-bodied to work. Are you for that? The, the 700,000 people that will lose their food stamps as a result of Trump's changes to the system accounts for a mere less than 1% of the federal spending. That cut in spending seems cruel and unnecessary to me. That if there are cuts to be made, it should be made off of the next bomb or the next tank. Mm -hmm. Stop killing people yeah. and start yeah. helping people. When you're in office and you're faced with questions, moral yeah. questions like that, as to where are these cuts supposed to come from? What what will guide your moral compass in making that decision? First off, that like I say, back to that police. Um, to the over policing, well I have to stop stop the spinning it. Um, like I say, in the black community, it's, it's damaging our community. It's not working. Like this, this summer, Lori brought out 1,500 officers to try to lessen the crime. And on the highest weekends of murder rates in the city of Chicago because of that. You know, they just came out yeah. even more. Um, <coughs> bring back the police. That's, that's spending. That cutting the spending itself now. With the overtime they, that they spend on it, it's ridiculous. Okay. I just like to know, I'm, I'm looking over here at my laptop on the web, and I'm not seeing a campaign website just a Facebook profile and a couple of announcements on your candidacy. Um, I know you, you maybe have raised some funds, but why don't you have a website up or? Actually, I do have a website up. What, what's it called? Joshforestaterep.com. Okay. Um, 
can you give me that URL one more time? Sure. Josh, J-O-S-H, number four, S-T-A-T-E, forstaterep.com. Josh, forstaterep.com. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I, my concern um, is the libertarians talk about regulation, and it almost, it makes sense. Oh, you know, yeah, regulation causes jo no jobs, but... The, there's another side to regulation in that, like, now I realize it seems like they deregulated everything, which can result in unfair elections because, you know, one party has, like, Mercer and Cambridge Analytica, and they, and it could be Democrat and Republican. It's like the right wing of both parties can control the internet, you know, can put in these police because the FOP and it, it, it begins to wake up to me that this idea of regulation, unions, you know, might be the, the way, the I'm just saying that it, it's got, the libertarian has a history of being almost anti-union, pro-management, and the problem is you've got something like the police union, which I agree, over-policing <coughs> is a disaster. The the, okay, this? I'm getting at it, okay? Um, the question is, how can you reconcile kind of the contradiction of being anti-regulation with unregulated FOP being behind putting all these dirty cops that torture people and build the big prisons? So you need regulation at a certain point. And I don't know that the libertarians are ever for regulation. Maybe I'm wrong. Could you correct me? Sure. Like I say, everything that is libertarian is not a part of my campaign, totally. Um, certain regulations are needed. Like you need, like just like doctors. Doctors need licenses. But a barber doesn't need licenses to cut hair. License. I agree. Yeah. You know, certain things like that's what we're talking about. That's more important. He has a license in the doctor. Yeah, regulation against. Well, right now, prosecutors and police have total immunity. <laughs> All right. And that's a giving them above the law Let's save it regulation. For the okay. So you have to regulate abuse of power. All right. That's what has been the labor, the left. The working class. Okay. Um, that. It's all right. Okay. I. Um. Well, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you be specific mm -hmm. on some of your initiatives or or bills you might introduce to the state of Illinois to help solve some of these problems? Um, like one of them, uh, I'd like to say, I'm big on that policing initiative because I'm a part of the MPI. I'm an ambassador of the MPI. It's 25th district in my community. So working with them is a, is a big deal to me, especially in my community, because I have a son in the community that's 20 years old. So. That's one of my biggest fears as well every time he leaves the house. So working with better, for them to get better training across the state, not just with city police, but mm -hmm. county and state as well. One of the, that's be one of the big, my first bills to be working on is to try to get better training for them. I don't think all officers are bad. It's just that 1% that steps out of their house, you know, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And that's my biggest fear there is working with them on the tra on new trainings, better training for the police officers. Yes. Uh, what, uh do you think it's the likelihood of you being elected? Very likely. Very likely. Um, I'm known in my community, not just in the Chicago side, but in Oak Park as well. I do a lot of volunteer work with the seniors in Oak Park as well as the seniors in Austin. That's the two biggest parts of my district, which is Austin and Oak Park. So I'm very well known between the two communities itself. I had a question. I want to really bring this up a lot. Okay, can you speak up, please? Gentrification. How do you feel about it? Um, it's, a, it's a change of our, our community right now. They're trying to do that now in our community with uh, Harlem and uh, North Avenue. They're trying to gentrify the, the Sears Roebuck area right there. Um, it's going to move out a lot of our people in the community. Um, it's a big fight with the Alderman because it's more of a municipal that we got to work, work together on uh, with Alderman Tower Federal. So. Mr. Flynn, you don't like regulations, but if they build a factory in your district, they may not be fair with the employees regarding wages because they won't apply the Fair Labor Standards Act. They might, they may not, they may cheat employees out of wages. They, they won't pay them overtime. 
they may since they may make them work in dangerous situations because they don't like OSHA regulations, and they also may be producing microplastics that pollute the whole community. And I don't think you want that, but you say you're opposed to regulation, blanket? Like I said earlier, I didn't say all regulations. Like I told you before in the previous, that not all, not, not all the libertarian regulations I'm against. Certain things I am against, some things I'm for. Like when it comes to the health and the safety of my community, yes, I'm going to be on their ass for it, yes. But when it comes, to, when you talk about so far as... environmental laws. Excuse me? Do you like environmental laws? That's something I have to work on more. I, I don't, I'm not too involved with that, but I have to learn more about that. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, these, let's the, um, go. And, uh, January 1st, Illinois is, marijuana is going to be legal in Illinois. There are certain dispensaries, I believe there's about 13 of them, that have been given a license to sell marijuana for recreational use inside the city of Chicago. How many of those licenses have been issued to residents of Austin? Zero. Do you have a dispensary in your neighborhood? Zero. Get Those one. are very lucrative licenses, though. Yeah. Why wasn't somebody in your neighborhood given one? Yeah. Would you be for them? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Would be away. Okay. Thank you for coming out, John. Uh, I've heard you speak a couple of times before, but I wanted to ask of uh, sitting politicians uh, in office uh, in Illinois right now in Springfield. Are there any that you would admire or would work with, uh, and any that need to go immediately? And similarly for any existing policies or programs in Illinois, uh, any that you like and would especially want to champion or save or keep, and any that you would list as having to go immediately? Thank you. Can I go and pass politicians? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was hoping for current names, but if you don't have any. Uh, past, past politicians that I am uh, favorite for was uh, Harold. That's what I'm like. Amen. Uh, you say against Mike Madigan. Okay. Amen. Uh, he needs to go. Amen. Um, what was your other question again? Uh, and yes, yeah, city politicians and then uh, current existing uh, Illinois policies or programs. Any that you would champion uh, and any that you would say, got to go the first day. I'm in office. Um, we, I, well, I'd like to get revised is that marijuana, to get it revised, because for some reason it's a regulation on it somewhere where a lot of people in my community is, don't have, that's not getting a license, and not applying for the license, yeah. and need to find out the issues why they're not applying for those licenses. Uh, they say it's a very easy process, but for some reason they're not applying for it. So I want to find out what's stopping people in the black communities across the city, across the state, but not applying for those licenses. Because none of the dispensaries are owned by blacks at all. Not a one. Yeah. But the black community has been damaged by marijuana because of it. So. <laughs> okay. Um, Please. If you could wave a magic wand and have whatever you wanted, either completely untaxed marijuana or have it legal but taxed, would you would you want to have it untaxed or have that uh, revenue? Untaxed. 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 Yeah. And just a follow-up question: If you had if you had to fund the government with only one source of revenue, would it be sales, income, or property taxes, or something else? What's the most efficient tax that you like? Oh no. Um, <laughs> if I had to choose, it's party sales tax. Yes. Yeah. spending every day. Cubs or Sox fan? Cubs. Oh, good. Oh, there goes Good. Off, yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, Ida B. Wells was quoted as saying that a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black household. How do you feel about the right of the people to keep and bear arms? Legally, correct? Or not? Or not. Yeah, I believe that everyone should have right to bear arms. Legally, yes. Legal right to bear arms, yes. How about felons? If they're served in time, the time is, they have served in time, yes. Their time has been served. They have, they have, they have citizens now, they have my constituents now. You know, they have done their time, they have done their rest, yes. Um, unless they were, you know, dangerous crimes. It's, it's a dangerous, it's a touchy situation, especially for my community. I'm talking about a community that has right now the highest murder rate in the city of Chicago right now. So it's in Austin. It's a it's a it's a hard subject to touch on. 
So we'll touch on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have so many illegal guns that get pushed through Austin, not just from out of state, but within the state. When I was a kid, we used to watch our own officers in our communities open up doors and leave guns in those cars, illegal guns. You know, when I was driving trucks, one of the rail yards on 63rd Street, they broke into it and stole a container of AK-47s, assault rifles, illegally. Um, a lot of that goes on. That's what it, that's where our murders come from, the illegal guns itself. Not the legal guns. So, yeah, it's a, it's a rough subject, especially in Austin across Chicago, you know what as well. Okay. How do you, I, I, as a black person, it seems to me there's an opportunity to stand up for civil rights, right? Um, because rather than just kind of identity politics or whatever, do you, are you, Speaking up about civil rights, uh, if we say here in Washington, that sounds right there, you know. I mean, how else can you get your message across is what distinguishes you, um, you know, and your platform and your... Well, it's not from my base in my home, mm -hmm. where I come from. I'm um, 32 years old. My mother and father were chef runners. They come from the Jim Crow South. Uh, my grandfather, his, he never met his father. He was killed in the plantation of where he, where he lived at. Uh, what it, actually, what our slave owners were at. So, my my base started at home from the Civil Rights Movement, yes. Uh, my father was the same age as my mother the king. My mother was born the same year as Pearl Harbor. So, that, I got that understanding, that growth from home itself. And it's still, and it's, it's still instilled in me, and that's what I instilled in my kids as well. Yeah, so, yeah, that message we get out there every time I speak, you will hear it. What's your birthday today? You're 33. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 33 now. Yeah. Happy birthday! Are you leveraging the black church community? Uh, no, I don't. I don't believe in focusing on the church. I, I believe politics should stand in the church itself. That should be separate. I, but I think they did a lot for here in Washington. They did. But mm -hmm. State should stay away from the church, like it should. Well, because um, everybody. So we say we're a Christian country, but when we're not, we have Muslims, we have Buddhists, we have different religions. We need to stay, keep it separate. We, don't, we should not ever conjoin it together, ever. There's a lot of political power there that It is, but be. it's definitely political power to change. The political power is in the people, not the church. Well, yeah, but, but like Nation of Islam or, or, you know, Father Flager's church. I, I you know, I, it, my observation has been there's a huge opportunity. Actually, I... This girl, Africa Porter, invited me to come to a Harold Washington, the people who got him elected. And they said, we need one candidate. You know, they really did. Because the truth is they needed. Civil rights is like a theology, liberation theology, right? And so I think there's an opportunity to, you know, when you mention liberation, to, that doesn't separate church and state. You know, that's a synthesis of the two. Well, I say I would have to. My father was a pastor, he was a bishop, and the church got into Christ. And we always spoke on this, and it should be separate. They do voting in churches now, they elect the bishops. That should not be as well, but it is. That's what they chose to do. Um, but yeah, it should be separate. I don't believe it should be controlled because of Honestly, it's easy to corrupt black churches. All you got to do is go in there with a few dollars. That's why you're a Democrat, Charlie. Uh, how do you feel about <clears throat> voting rights for uh, people in prison? Uh, <clears throat> maybe who? who or, yeah, it, yeah. Voting rights for people in prison. Thoughts? In prison, no. In county jail, yes. You know, they haven't been convicted. Yes, I believe they should be able to have the chance to vote. Um, another thing, when the, when the prisons are released, a lot of them cannot vote amongst, amongst the time that they're released. I think that should change as well. Like I say, once you serve your time, you can gain back your guests to society. You know, you, it's time to be a citizen again. And how can you be a citizen if you can't even vote for your own, for your own rights that you had you know, as a citizen? What? I don't want to stick on this black church bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's a comment here. No, but I also, I also want to uh, talk about the fact that even with like the black church vote, uh, typically black communities still have the lowest turnout when it comes to voting, right? So even if you were to go inside the church and get a few people, how else do you raise the voting uh, turnout in these communities? What are you gonna do about that? The civic engagement, it has to change. 
that's not that's not there at all in the community outside of the church. The church numbers are decreasing. A lot of people are not attending as well as they used to in our communities. But we need to start with the civic engagement back into the schools a lot stronger than what they used to be, as what they are right now. Um, and also with different programs outside of the school itself. More civic engagement. Get understanding about voting, about the process, about election cycles. Uh, if you ask the average person that's my age, half of them don't vote. Millennials just don't vote. And you can see what they turn out with the, with the past races. They just don't turn out and vote. Okay. Well, Mr. Flynn, um, Correct me, I, I stepped out if this has been covered, but it's been shown over and over that if you affect gun control, you reduce to zero the incident of gun violence. Yet the Libertarian Party staunchly opposes affecting gun control. So how do you propose reconciling this well, gun apparent control. conflict? Gun control is meant for law-abiding citizens. It is not meant for a criminal. If I'm a criminal, if I'm a murderer, I'm not going to think about a gun law, a gun rule, a gun zone. I'm going to commit my crime and keep moving forward. That, that's the problem. It's, it's just basically deregulating de the, the law-abiding citizens from ha having, having going through these constant processes. Constantly paying more just to get licenses. In. That cost them went up. For law-abiding citizens that wants to protect their family. Now you want to make me pay more to protect my family in Austin. No, so you're making, right. you want it to be easier for individuals to own what Do you want to get <coughs> out guns and ammunition? For legal law-abiding citizens, yeah. yes. Legal law-abiding citizens. You want to give out guns legal law-abiding citizens. <coughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, I've been reading a book recently uh, about Operation Greylord, which was a sting operation about judicial corruption in Cook County back in the 1980s. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the courts uh, in your district and in Cook County or Illinois generally, um, and about investigation uh, into their conduct. Thank you. Sure. Yes, I, yeah, it should be, because a, uh, a lot of judges, people don't, they don't know the judges. Uh, they sit there for six to ten year races, years in office, and no one knows who they are, what they, what, what's, what's going on with the judges. So like I said, the civic engagement is needed because of that process itself. You get a better understanding of that. Um, but like this 1980, I, I don't know too much about it. I, was, I wasn't even born just yet, so. Yeah. I like it's looking quite, quite a story. It's one of the guys who's one of the moles in the case. Okay. A couple of years ago. All right. Um, I think he's... Um, so you mentioned education um, and the lack of civic education in our schools. I want to know how do you feel about uh, LGBTQ history will be taught in the schools and uh, civic education is not, right? And so how are you going to, well, there's two part question. How do you feel about LGBTQ studies being taught in the schools from as young as about, I think, sixth grade or something like that it's like it's a really young age and then um how how are you going to band together with the other state reps in order to get civic education passed so that that could be something that could be taught from that sixth grade level up? uh working together working together with the, that same community the lgbt community they help me co-opt to get those civic engagement programs into the schools as well we got to band together because at the end of the day it's all our kids that's going to these schools and working with both communities is what's going to help out to get that passed. So working with the LGBT community as far as the, the legislators that are LGBTQ, well, and also with the ones that's actually trying to push for civic education amongst our schools. It's just co oping together, working together, hand-in-hand -hand with them. Okay. First question, how do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? Yeah. We need, to, we need to learn about everybody's, we need to know and learn about everybody else's uh, rights. Is there a rights to have that talk in the schools? Uh, we need to know. We don't know. We, we, but it we came don't. before African American history. Okay. Um, well, we got a rebuttal period coming up. So, yes, I know. But uh, uh, I think Dave here hasn't had a question yet. Yes. How do you feel about the teaching of the Holocaust about the Holocaust in the public schools? 
It's a part of our history. It's a part of our national history. Yes, it should be taught in schools. Okay, and you had a question? I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about sanctuary states and the immigration and the rights of immigrants in the state of Illinois. Um, when you talk about, I have a friend of mine I haven't heard from him since last year. Um, he wasn't. He was born in Mexico. I don't know if he's gone or what, what's happened to him. He's just up and vanished from me. Um, I don't agree what's going on at the borders at all. Um, I don't. I really, when you stretch the part of a mother and a father, a son from their kids, it's uh, it's detrimental. It happened to us coming here from Africa. We were removed from our parents, and their history is just moving along to another, just another culture. And I don't think it should be. Um, totally against that altogether. Um, we're asking your question. We have another question on it. Just, in, just the immigration in general. Should we, should we let those people in? Yes, I think we should. Okay. Yeah. Uh, speak the schools. Um, you know, it, I actually substituted in at Austin and tried to. For a day or two. Austin and, uh, High School? Yeah, Austin High School. How'd they go? Uh, it wasn't that bad, but, um, you know, yeah. it. Luke, I asked the girl, I go, it didn't seem that bad. She said they'd gotten rid of all the really bad ones, but they, they threw a paper ball at me. But it, I, the issue of unions and charter schools and what the solution is, uh, you know, I used, I was raised by a libertarian Milton Friedman guy, and he taught me unions are bad. Now, at this age, um, in hindsight, I think I would want the teachers' union endorsement. I think it could go a long way. What, how do you think, would, is there, do you think the libertarianism is going to get in the way of the teachers' union endorsement? And maybe, you know, there is a charter school versus public school debate in terms of resources not going to the public schools, but going to like a Bruce Rauner. His charter school had been a law school. What's the question? Now it's a, a lousy one. I'm asking how he would reconcile the libertarian support for charter schools versus a public schools. That's this simple. Is a abolish public, libertarian debate. Abolish public education uh -huh. and privatize it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, I, you might want to think about that, you know, if, uh, <laughs> what the unintended negative consequences are <clears throat> as a libertarian. Well, I can speak on that a little bit. My daughter goes to charter school. Mm -hmm. My daughter was in private school. She didn't perform well at private school. And when she moved to the charter school, she, her performance increased on a roll every six. Um, every kid is going to excel differently in different schools, different situations, different areas. I don't think we should worry so much about that because we don't have public schools regardless. We don't have the charter, we don't have the private. What we should focus more on is the communication between the parent, the facilitators there, the school, and the child. If, you don't, if those three are not working together, I don't care what school you're going to be in, you're going to have problems across the nation with schools. Better, or, organizing better with those three, you, you'll see a difference in the school changes. That's the problem right now. Everybody's so worried about the, the kids, how the kids are performing, where they're not performing well because nobody's working with them, asking them, talking to them. That's the way we fail it right there. Okay. Yes? I got a question about opportunity to use since we're right there. Uh, that, that are those youth between 16 and 24 that are in danger of dropping out of school, doing drugs, joining gangs. Um, the, the, the rate in Illinois is probably just twice the rate of other um, states in this country. And so just wondering, at state rep, what are you going to do to help uh, with that ratio of uh, opportunity youth that are just hanging out, you know, that they have nowhere or nothing, nowhere to go, no, nothing to do? Well, like I said, we got to we gotta bring the parent in that, in that school together. We got to talk. We got to have the conversation together. We got to listen to the kids. We, we, so we, we do so much talking as adults, we don't listen. Mm. When you start listening, you start seeing a change in our communities. Mm. Uh, like like my, my dad always say, he gave you, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Do more listening than talking. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. okay. uh, all right, let's uh, think got, about, okay, let's yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Is, I, I, my theory is that the libertarian goes along with supply side economics, and I, it's not necessarily connected to the demand side of 
like the equation. So like you say, the students, the needs of the students. It's, do you ever, can you think about how, you know, you might work to, I don't know, without regulation, make sure that the supply and the demand in terms of educational equity, the resources that go to the Austin area, how, how are you going to reconcile that? Because it seems like you're left to a free market right now. In Chicago, the money is it's determined by the property taxes. And it, you know, so the schools are going to be under-resourced. And, um, and the parents don't have enough money to send them to a Catholic or private school or I, Vultures. I mean, there's a gap there economically right do you can you speak to that Vultures. Well, you know, we have scholarships we no longer call it vouchers but you have scholarships that those kids can go to private schools it, it would be paid for through scholarships they have mentors that pay a portion of that money itself um, that would be an adjustment and change as well um, when you say demand what do you explain it to me when you say demand the demand is is like the consumer the citizen the families, the, the need of a, like a consumer versus a corporation is a supply and a bank, but, and the demand is actually, you know, kids that need educating, you know, how, and there's a, seems to be a huge gap, the inequality gap of the, the supply, 1% saying, oh, if we keep all the money, it'll come trickling down, but it hasn't <coughs> paid off that way, um, you know, with Ronald Reagan's trickle down economics didn't seem to work, right? And I don't, I don't think you can blame it. What's the question? Well, I'm just asking, how do we deal with the realities of this economic inequality? I, I just, I think it's the system, That's stupid, the right? And um, Yeah. Uh, so how are we going to deal with these systemic issues where ideology doesn't necessarily fix the system of supply and demand and economics really working? It used to be there was regulation of economics that have kind of been taken away since the 70s, I think. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, I've got a ready answer, but you're the, you're the guy who needs to speak. I need to trust the inequalities. Yeah. Well, we basically just let them be. Excuse me, say again. Let them be? Uh -huh. No, you don't let them be. Um, well, like I said, one other thing is in our school systems we have to have is better trained teachers, right? We have a lot of teachers that are underperforming themselves. You know, how do we change, what, what do we do about that? We're working with those teachers to bring better trained teachers into those schools, better trained principals in those schools. A lot of our kids, they do a lot of uh, trying to do obedience towards our, our children. It's a lot different from a kid that's on the north side of Chicago, Lakeview. You'll treat a kid different from Austin because those kids are from different homes, different backgrounds, and that understanding is not there. The teachers are not from those communities. I had a lot of teachers in my, in my school that wasn't from my community. They didn't understand our kids being hungry early in the morning, not understanding why that kid clothes is busted. You don't understand it because you're not from that field, you're not from that area. Until you come from that area and understand it, you cannot move forward with us. Um, you need, we need more teachers that are from the community to help our kids grow because they understand. You know, a teacher from Barrington is not no way in the hell is going to understand a kid from Inglewood or a kid from Bronzeville at all. We got to change that as well. That's, that's, that's another way of growth towards that position that for our demand that you're talking about. Um, so. Okay, let's make this. Uh, we I gotta. Just, I, I, I got I a question. You're not looking around, Tim. Oh, right here. Where you can go? You can come. I was talking. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want to know under under your steward in the in the state capitol, what are you gonna do specifically for black people? For black people. Question is, what is the legislature? What is specifically going to do for black people? During your team, what are you going to do? What What are you going to do to do better the position that we are in now? Bring economics to our community. We got to bring it to our community. We don't have it. How? What I would like to see is be able to have more constituent-based businesses in our community. The majority of the businesses, people, they don't live there. They're not from our communities at all. The liquor stores that you brought up, every liquor store in my community is not owned by anyone from our community at all. The bar only thing we have in our community is barbershops and about three, the three restaurants. That's about it. Everything else is from outside businesses. It's time for people that live there to own businesses here. That's what I want to help bring it to Austin. So you, okay. What will you do to address the criticism 
They are. Well, I'm a libertarian. I'm black, so explain them to me. I'm poor and I'm white and I'm poor. Uh, how did you come to your libertarian beliefs? Did you grow up uh, in a family that uh, espoused? Uh, uh, no, actually, I grew up as a Democrat. I grew up in a Democratic home. My father was good friends with Danny Davis, my congressman. We did a lot of uh, canvassing for him as a kid growing up. And uh, that's how I got into politics. When I switched off was when I started looking at my community every time I go outside. I'm a community organizer. I'm an organizer can do is can go out and find a problem. And every time I left my home, I seen a problem. I seen kids were hungry. I seen people not working. I seen abandoned housing in my community. That's what made me change and look, look a different direction. I looked at the Republican Party and I looked, there was no connection coming back to my community. No talking, no communicating at all. And when the Libertarians came to my community, that was the only party that sourced into my community outside the Green Party. That's what, that's what made me turn it into the, the Libertarian. Okay. But not a Democrat because he, no. they're corrupt or, or, I mean, Danny Davis is a good guy. I'm a class, I'm not. If I'm a good guy. <laughs> I don't. I just. I, he seemed trustworthy. You know, Danny Davis. Mm -hmm. My interactions with him. Yeah, he Davis? stood yeah. up for anti-policing. You know, anti for this uh, Center for Wrongful Convictions. I, I, he's done a spoken up a lot. I, I wish he'd speak up more. Maybe nice. He sounds good on children books. Danny Davis for the past three cycles and overspent. In his, in his uh, right now he spends thirty-five hundred dollars a month just for his office. Over on California, so uh, that's overspending. It shouldn't cost that much over on California. Also. He has a person in his office makes more than make more than him in his office. So um, you say he's a good guy. That's, that's nice to see. I understand what you're coming from. Relatively. All right. Let's do one more round of questions, and then we're going to go to rebuttal yeah. soon. Because I know. Yeah. I know a lot of people have probably got a lot to say, and we've had a lot of the same. Charlie, how are you going to do it? <laughs> how am I going to do it? We'll cut off questioning later on. No, Charlie, go ahead. Is that the question? Or, yeah. Charlie, go ahead. All right. Uh, you said you looked around, but I know there's a candidate against Davis in the seventh district, who's and all of the energy in politics right now is with the progressives and a democratic socialist. Enormous <laughs> recruitment energy. Democratic socialists fill a room of five, about several hundred people when they have meetings. And you tell me you looked around and you didn't see, I mean, the energy at AOC and Bernie Sanders and this democratic socialism. I'm wondering why, why, why did you not choose that that as the direction to go. Obviously, Charlie has never up and out to Kemak Henry County or Huntley, Illinois. No, or I see a, a lot. Seriously, there's another candidate uh -huh. from that at the Anthony Clark. Yes. And what about drawing a lot of attention. And he chose Democratic Socialism. Why did he choose Democratic Socialism? And he took apparently the opposite. Well, he's from a different community itself. He's from Old Park. Old Park and Austin is two different communities. Yeah. They are nothing alike at all. The divide is Austin Boulevard. You step foot across Austin, coming back eastbound, it's not the same. The crime is totally different. Democratic socialists work, probably work fine in Old Park, but it's not working in Austin at all. Uh -oh. It's not working at all. Not working. Look at the stats itself. Socialists when was it dry? Yeah. They, they don't come to the office. They have. When was it dry? It was a Where are they? <laughs> Johnson. And the Johnson. New Society. <laughs> Why didn't it work? They're rich. They need people there. like you to organize. <laughs> I went to an organizer meeting of the Democratic okay. Socialists. All right. They're speaking here next week. You know? We, uh... Yeah. Who's got, it? Who's got control. more questions? Who's got last question? Yeah, you got last question. question. That's your question. Oh, my yeah. question is: Who's got last question? <laughs> how how uh, how can uh, people uh, donate money to your campaign if they want to help out with a contribution? Okay, I've got an answer for that one. They just go to his website at. Uh, <laughs> give us your website. JohnForStateRep.com. J O S H 
four, the number four, S T A T E, rep, R E P dot com, and hit the donate button. And there, that's all there is to it. Let's give a hand for our speaker tonight. <laughs> Amy, would you help moderate during the rebuttals? And just keep, keep a time on it. How many tonight are wanting to rebut? Uh, 36. Can you count, please? 740. Would you mind counting? Keep your hands up, please. We'll go about five minutes each because we have some time. You don't have to use all that time. But let's get started and uh, get our rebutters going. We already yeah. did. Yes. You have a seat and uh, relax. You'll get the last word. Um, Okay. But the, each, each speaker's got five minutes. I think Dr. spoke very well. Okay. Come on, there's you an open mic. We can get a speaker up there. I, you had a sunshot. All right, Jean, let's... Uh, well, if nobody else will come up here, I will. Good. I haven't heard the name of Kelly Cassidy here. Why? Because she's my... State rep. Oh, so uh, I live on the north side near Bryn Mawr, and she, and if I want to talk to her, uh, she's got an email and it comes to my uh, computer. And if I want to see her, I walk over to Bryn Mawr and then walk down Broadway because that's where her office is. And I'm satisfied with her. She is a Democrat. And why am I satisfied with her? Well, look at me. I'm an old white male, and I've lived in my apartment since 2005. So everything's OK with me. And the system that I've got is generally uh, pretty good. But uh, this does not speak very well for the rest of the people, and a few of them are here, not many of them, but this does not reflect the black community, although the black people in my community are probably fairly satisfied with Kelly Cassidy, whose name you didn't uh, hear tonight, and I suspect she will not be opposed she was opposed the first time she ran and she won so uh, again who is satisfied well people like me white old males who have a pension and i don't worry about any of these things but it, it's interesting that we have so many problems in our community not many on the north side although two and I see uh, three or four people asking me for money on Bren Moor. And what are they? Black males. And somebody will say, oh, they don't need any money. They're in a nursing home. Well, guess what? I'm not asking for money. So what's wrong with this system? Think it over. All right. What's wrong with this system? Good evening. Good evening. One at a time, guys. Good evening. Uh, I'm David Trails, and I'd like to uh, say that I, I think what hasn't been touched on enough this evening is that what is really needed is greater law enforcement. Uh, <clears throat> the best set of laws in the world would be ineffectual without enforcement. Um, as I see it, it's always the few who are the troublemakers and the many who get blamed for it. If, if you mention something about a black neighborhood, people say, oh, that's a black neighborhood, that's so dangerous. But I, I remember in um, the Mexican neighborhood on uh, Cermak and uh, California, I think it was, there was a 
some people who stood up against a, uh, a gang member who caused them a lot of trouble, and they were arrested, and they were prosecuted, and the rest of their gang came in and set fire to their, those people's house. Uh, the police quickly rounded up the rest of the gang, and th those gang members were put in prison. And since then, that Mexican neighborhood became much better. Uh, they started having Mexican restaurants and people from all over the country coming to uh, eat, to dine at Mexican, authentic Mexican restaurants. And it worked out pretty good. So when, when the members of a neighborhood stand up against criminal elements, and see that they're prosecuted, the, the neighborhood usually becomes better. It's always the few who cause the most trouble, and it's always the many who are blamed for the neighborhood being bad, whether it's Mexican, Puerto Rican, uh, black, or whatever. So what is needed is greater law enforcement and stricter penalties for offenders. This, I think, is extremely important uh, to have a to have better communities throughout the entire city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Hi, I'm Brian Denny. I am a proud libertarian. Um, I don't necessarily agree with my party's position on a lot of issues. And one of those issues would be what to do about the inequalities that have arisen in our society. <coughs> Unfettered capitalism had proven a failure, and that's why government wound up getting as big as it did. Um, I don't agree that more government is a solution to that problem because I believe that our politicians are inherently corrupt. And to give them more power, would just give them greater opportunity to steal from us. I, I do, however, wonder how do libertarians help to bridge the gap with some of those socialist democrats who really look at the system and say, we want some of this money to go to the people and stop being wasted or stolen. And I don't, I don't necessarily agree, disagree with the democratic socialists. You, you know, stop building bombs. Stop killing people. Stop locking people in jail. Stop hassling people. Stop hurting and help people. And the Libertarians' Party does not seem to have a very good answer for those questions. The free market's not in, and I hope that Joshua, as you develop your campaign and your positions more, you can help ferret out some of those issues because there are tremendous injustices in our society that need to be addressed. And. Um, and politicians of good heart and goodwill can do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I spoke to them. Mm -hmm. Is it? No. You gonna come up? Ladies first. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Um. Thank you, Joshua. That was great. I, I am glad to hear people like you, honest, good people, stepping up and um. I tried to step up uh, to run as an alderman and a mayor, and I still, I'm thinking of running as a Republican for president, <laughs> because I really want to challenge, it's corruption, that's the problem. I, I, I'm an adult child of a Republican family, actually a libertarian family, and um, which means, it's kind of a joke, but that like an adult child of an alcoholic family, but it, it's a dysfunctional family that, at the age of 64, I now look at and think, you know, it's it's my lion eyes. I, you know, my eyes aren't lying. It's the individual I'd be voting for. But I, I think there's value as a market researcher to look and see who is your base. And I, I don't think the libertarians uh, really are as likely it is hard to mobilize the black population and I, I went and got my CADC at Kennedy King and um, uh, at Howard Washington and 
I was surprised, it was during the election, how little interest there was in getting out for anything. I was pushing for Chewy at the time against Rahm Emanuel. I, I do a lot of opposition research, basically, and it's corruption on the right wing of both parties that we have to worry about. Um, they are like a police state. They are operating with trillions of dollars that have been given to them by the super PACs, the National Security Political Action Committee started in, uh, I just read about, they were the ones who financed uh, Roger Ailes' development of the Willie Horton ads back for, for George Bush. You know, you, you have to watch out. I need you to hold on a minute. I don't know if y'all heard that. Roger Ailes, in the 1990s, organized, wrote the Willie Horton ad. It's a dirty propaganda technique, right, to associate the Democrat with, with giving furloughs to blacks who deserve them. They made an issue using dirty politics and dirty propaganda and have been doing it ever since then. Now we've got Fox News. So uh, you've got to recognize that it really is I've come to see the right wing are like the fascists and the left wing are like the communists, right? And there's the manager's revolution versus the people's revolution. And you've got to stand with the people, the 99%. And really the whole, just just because Mike Madigan's corrupt, this is called Danny Davis may, every time people get in office, they tend to get a little more corrupt. Um, they actually tried to run me, the Democratic Party, and I am an anti-corruption zealot, you know? I mean, I'm like a saint. I do not, I hate corruption. And that's why I'm, they go, well, just let us run you around as clerk and just do what we tell you to do and maybe hire a couple of people. It was like working for the union and I couldn't do it, uh, you know? And But I don't know that Mr. Smith can get to Washington anymore or Miss Smith. You know, um, I'm all for you, but it, we have to somehow have a organized organization, party behind us. And the, actually, some study I saw, Charlie may know, 40% of people are independent. 30 may be left wing or 30 right wing. And right now, um, the, the independent is like we're atomized. We don't have a voice. It, and I, I think the you know, the socialist, the libertarian. Libertarian are, I guess, basically anarchists, and I, that makes sense, but if they're more, really more managerial, pro-business. Um, that's, my stepfather was one, his friends of Milton Friedman, they know Bill Crystal and Irving Crystal. The book I was gonna recommend tonight, uh, I will recommend, is The Culture Wars. I'm, Reading up on this, this is where I got this about Roger Ailes working for Willie Horton ads. Uh, it's corruption, right? And propaganda, mafia state is what we've gotten to, right? It's we really do, and it, both parties are bad. It's it's very discouraging, and the media has really been captured. Capitalism has trumped. I'm really I'm going to write conscience of a communist, you know, because really they the capitalists have warred on anarchists and communism, and uh, it's basically fascism. Thank you. All right, next. With regard to the comments that were made earlier about term limits, All right. I'm opposed to term limits. We already have a system in place, and that they're called elections. That's number one. Number two, I happen to be a huge fan of Nancy Pelosi, who I have no doubt will rank with um, <clears throat> Henry Clay, Thomas Reed, Sam Rayburn, and Thomas O'Neill as one of the all-time great speakers of the House. Because number one, she has held together a fractious caucus, and number two, she took that spoiled brat, Don Donald Trump, and for the first time in his life, and in the best mother of five manner, she took him out and gave him a public spanking which is he got told no for the first time. Yeah. And he's had that coming for a long time. And finally, with regard to the comment that Ellen made about having a
paper, a paper ball thrown at her when she was a substitute teacher. When I was a student at Evanston Township High School some 50 years ago, well, that's something that often happened to substitute teachers when I was there. <laughs> okay, next. Next, here. Next. Are you going up, guys, or are you going to go down? It's your call. All right, Jonathan. This is Triumph Number Two. Thank you, Josh, for a great talk. I'm glad you were here tonight. Um, before I get to uh, why I was impressed tonight by our speaker, just want to uh, quickly say some uh, things for our New Year's re resolution for the College of Complexes very briefly. Um, what do we need to improve in 2020 at the College of Complexes? Uh, I hope you all have your own suggestions that during the college and at the after party, uh, you contribute to the dialogue, but these are my four. These are my top four. We need to rampify the room so those members of the disability community who cannot access the mic can do so. Uh, it's the voices that we haven't heard yet that we most need to hear, and I'm especially looking at myself in the mirror when I'm saying that, not disabled white male folk Americans. Uh, we need to listen more, us non-disabled white male Americans, mm -hmm. and stop talking. I've told those. We got somebody in D.C. right now who loves to talk, and you know that's just the road to hell when you can't humble yourself and listen. So I had a lot of questions, but uh, I mean he hit it out of the park. You know, when you say you like Harold Washington, uh, even though I'm not a libertarian and proudly so. Uh, I'm in your corner on the things you want to accomplish for your community because I know that you survived in a community where I could have never survived and it's an absolute miracle and I don't say that to put you on a pedestal I just you know just think how hard it was in the western suburbs when Fred Hampton had to grow up in the things he had to face and just multiply that by about a trillion those of us who have had co-workers and friends of faith organizations from the African American community who were humbled enough to be welcomed to Sunday morning worship services or welcomed into a wedding where we knew we had a responsibility for the rest of our life not just to be a good human being but to be a revolutionary. Number two on my list is we need 50-50 female and male speakers. Why? Because there's 50-50 male and females on planet Earth. How the fuck are you going to do that? Pretty, exactly. There we go. One full of time. Time. There How are you do that? I'd like, to hear, I'd like to hear in the after party why you disagree with because that. Because it's first come, first serve. Whoever comes fair up enough, with fair it, enough, enough, it's enough. on the schedule. Fair enough. One full of time. And it's, I don't it's care if it's man, woman, woman. It's not animal, personal. It's just a suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Martian. Yeah, men are better speakers than women. One full of time. Oh, you can't speak because we need a woman. Okay. All I'm saying is it's the voices that we don't hear that we most need to hear. Wait a minute. This is not a One Yule at a time. One Yule at a time. What does that have to do with the topic All right. tonight? One Yule at a time. Number three. I got five minutes, so I'm going to use it. It's a democracy or it's not. Uh, number three. Libertarians, back me up on this, please. Even though I'm not a libertarian, freedom of speech. One Yule at a time. Number three, start 15 to 20 minutes earlier. That way we don't have to run out of the restaurant when they're about to close. Yeah. It's just common sense. That's one and one. Term two and three. Yeah. yeah. Number yeah. four. Yeah. Number four, write the questions before asking them. Oh, now, I will say this because I'm the worst person at asking a question if I haven't written it down yet. Now, those are my four suggestions humbly made. Hey. Done with that. I'm going to rebut them, like, right now. I'm going to rebut him like right now because some of the most beloved and cherished blessings from knowing Mother Earth are that each and every day we have countless opportunities to be with her, to listen to her, to learn from her, to respect her, to help her, to nurture her, to protect her, 
to grow with her, to celebrate her, to empower her, to rejoice with her, to walk with her, to organize with her, to keep the community strong and safe for her and with her, to keep the house clean and kind, to keep our principles fair and free, living peaceful and welcoming her, to dance with her, to cooperate with her, to thank her, to talk with her, to laugh with her, to teach others all about her, and to remember she's always here with us all. When I heard that you volunteer with seniors, I was not surprised. Because if you volunteer to help seniors, there ain't no money in that. You do it because you got heart and you got soul and you love our community, no matter what community it is on planet Earth. So I just, you know, I thank you again for your service in an area that most people say, I ain't going in that area because there's no money in it. You have my respect for life for that. Okay. Uh, I have a book that I'd like to present to you for the holidays by the world's most cited living author named Noam Chomsky, Requiem for the American Dream, Ten Principles of Concentration of Wealth and Power. Uh, if you'd like to come back and tell me what we agree on on this book, I think it would be a great dialogue, not a debate, more like a dialogue of what we agree on because I like what I heard tonight even though I'm a democratic socialist. Sorry I said the SD word. <laughs> Thank you very much, Josh. Okay. Yeah. Get your sign up, John. Please. I wonder if he's I want your sign. Because I, I want to rebut those points. No, there's nothing to rebut that. Jim, we're not going over that, Chip. It's not supposed to be this anyway. You don't run the fucking college. All right. Uh, <laughs> one fool at a time, guys. One fool. Uh, okay. Number one. Okay. We do cater to the disabled people here. I've often told them if you want to speak and you can't make it up front, I will bring the camera to you so you can. I have made that accommodation several times, and they say no. We want ramps. Now, we can't pay for ramps to the college. The we didn't ask you to will. pay for them. We asked the staffers to start a fund. Yes, if they want to. But as far as them not being able to get up here and not speak, that is not the case. I have said many times, if you want to say something, I will bring the camera and microphone to you. Wait a minute, we've never had One anybody One bullet at a time, Charlie. Hey, we have just One bullet at a time, Charlie. We have no time, Charlie. 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 Where is the disabled person who has to speak? They've asked a couple times over who? here. Charlie, not me. I, they've asked me, Charlie. I'm the program coordinator. I got no request. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about like during the question. They never came rebuttals. with a request. Charlie, they, not to you, but they have to me. Now, about starting on time. Yes. You're not the program One coordinator. One at a time. I would like to start on time. You guys come at 10 after 6, okay? You guys come in late. Therefore, I have to adjust accordingly. There's also something called, I come from Algonquin for traffic. And I do try to get everything moving on time. If our speakers were prepared, and they had their things in their downloads and didn't have special requests at the last minute, we might be able to get this technology under control. Yes, David. Excuse me, it, it says on the program we start at 6 o'clock. That's right. I came here at a quarter till. I know. One bullet at a time. One bullet at a time, guys. As far as the other concerns about a 50-50 mix, I don't think, we don't like quotas. We go on a first come, first serve basis who speaks. And Charlie has done a damn good job of keeping the schedule clean, keep up, put in, a, put in a lot of speakers, and he's six months out. If you want to speak, if you want to speak, you contact Charlie, and he'll put you no, in the schedule. No, we're going to make Jonathan the speaker. One bullet time, Charlie. Make him the no, no, 
now. You know how to do it? One more time. Jonathan. Charlie. And I. Jonathan. I didn't know how to do it better, John. I didn't know how to do it better. All right, now. Friendly questions are ridiculous. This is a free speech forum. You should be entitled to answer your questions. This is a free speech forum. Written questions are ridiculous. One more time, Pam. All right. I've said what I had to say here. Now you can see that this has drawn a lot of controversy already. Not really. Time is up, Tim. For most if Americans. you want to have ramps, ask dappers. Yes. If disabled people want to speak, ask me. I will bring the microphone to you. If you want a speaker and he wants to be up here during a presentation, we can lift the equipment. We can exactly. Make this is, should be done during the course of this meeting. One full at a time, Charlie. Hey, one full at a time, Charlie. Be invited one more time when you're dismissed. Right. Jonathan, one full at a time, Charlie. All right, now. With that off the clock. All that being said. I think Jonathan, Jonathan is asking questions, asking questions, yeah, and he's got his answers. Now, we understand, you know, the thing is, is that anybody who wants to speak is more than welcome to come up. The only thing I ask as a speaker is that you be prepared, be ready to speak on a subject, and make sure you research, because the last thing people want to hear is somebody just rambling on about nothing for 90 minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah, there you go. All right. Next. No. Sir, I'm No. All right. One full, guys. Thanks again to Joshua for coming out here and speaking. I heard him a couple of times before. Um, for the few minutes that I have, I'm going to tell everyone a little bit more about uh, this. is a book by Terrence Haik, uh, who was one of the investigators on Operation Greylord here in Cook County. Haik, H A K E, Terry Haik or Terrence Haik, and it, his co-author on this book was a, I believe, retired journalist named Wayne Klatt, K-L-A-T-T, -T, Operation Greylord, uh, Gray with an E. And he was a state's attorney, assistant state's attorney um, 40 years ago who went to undercover. Uh, and they said that at the time there were estimates that maybe as many as half of the judges in Cook County were corrupt taking bribes, usually from fixers associated with defense attorneys because that was easier to do than um, bribing the prosecutors. Uh, but it's a fascinating look. I'm about two-thirds of the way through the book now. Um, there are a couple of others that were written about this particular sting operation by other people who participated in it. One was a judge from downstate uh, who passed away in the last couple of years, or maybe even earlier this year, Brockton Lockwood. Yeah, uh, but this was a case that I did not remember when it happened. I'm up to about 1982 in this story now, and it's a reminder that some of these investigations can take years, and they still only grabbed you know, a relatively few judges out of what they might have estimated to be a wider uh, network of corruption and intermediaries amongst the courtroom employees uh, as well as a lot of the uh, lower level attorneys who would run the envelopes of money back and forth. I, would, I will say Mr. Hake is probably a little different than myself. He seems like a, a bit of a, I don't know, maybe a bit square uh, about um, a conventional approach 40 years ago to the war on drugs that you know, I might quibble with, but when you're having your defense attorney slip a thousand dollars to the judge to drop the case, that's crooked, uh, no matter how you slice it. Um, for something Ellen had been pulling on, uh, on and off throughout the night, um, why not going through the major parties? Uh, the thing about the major parties is, by nature of being so large, they can be home to a lot of different contradictory factions. Now. Even in a small party like the Libertarians, you know, where we get three to five percent of the vote in many cases. I know there are several different tendencies, even with 
within a group as relatively small as our own. But within these parties that often garner 40 or 50 percent of the vote, there's people there who have no logical reason to necessarily be in the same party. And when you look at other political systems um, where they have proportional representation or a larger uh, set of options on the ballot, uh, you know, in Canada, Bernie Sanders and uh, Joe Biden wouldn't have been in the same party. They would have been in two different parties. In a number of European countries, that would be true. In places where that isn't true, like in Britain with the Labour Party, it's, they s suffered a real massive defeat in the recent parliamentary election because having the Marxist wing and the moderate wing of the Labour Party didn't really hold up very well, uh, even though there were just as many divides in the Conservative Party in Britain between what had once upon a time been the wing of the party that wanted to trade with Europe and now the sort of Brexit fever uh, that has swept along a lot of the Tories. Uh, and, you know, it's for the Democrats in the room to deal with what makes sense about a party that contains both Amy Klobuchar and Bernie Sanders. You know, you deal with the contradictions that you have in an organization that's that large or in any coalition that is that large. Uh, I've only got about 30 or 40 seconds left, so instead of pulling out a random quote from another book, I'll just wish you all a very happy new year, and we'll see what we can do about uh, maybe more equitable use of speaking slots and starting 15 to 20 minutes earlier. We all promise to be better with our punctuality. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Uh, very nice. He has handled a lot of the questions, tough questions very well. And good luck on your campaign, sincerely. I'll speak on three, I'm um, eclectic as usual, but I'm going to focus on three specific concerns. Number one, I noticed, at least on the social media, that your major element of your campaign was that you were for term limits. That is of no interest whatsoever to the constituents. I'm a resident of the city. I don't perceive how that appeals to the constituents of that district. They're concerned about jobs. They're concerned about policing. They're corrupt, not corruption, I don't know what that means. But they're concerned about jobs, a safe community. And term limits, as a matter of fact, from a political science view, we've got some guys here that love that topic. There's nothing to establish that term limits would bring about any improvement in what is called good government. There's no study on record whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it's contrary to bringing about good government. There's nothing to establish at what year someone in a term of office goes from being a good official to a bad official. Is it two years, four years, six years, 20? Nothing whatsoever. But you are advocating this without any logical or reasonable basis. The same with the Libertarian Party, for that matter. Seniority is found in every union contract, and it's a good thing to have on a resume, I assure you, if you want to get a job. It shows experience. It shows that someone has years of credible service in the position as a matter of fact, in the American Federal Civil Service, that is looked upon as the number one factor of, a, of an employee's years of credible service on record. And you are going to punish people for doing so with no, no assurance whatsoever that the new person who's taking the office is good. It's a 50-50 chance. Well, that's not how we operate in a logical, real world. Um, the only, the real problem is, is that incumbents get reelected. I don't think an incumbent to the Union, United States Congress in the past century has lost, quote now, in the general election. That is the issue. How to, is their unfair advantage to the person in the office versus any challengers. That is the issue. That is the issue you should be looking at. And okay, enough of the poli sci election. Another thing, I've been with the independent voters of Illinois for over 25 years as one of the three chief officers. And we give endorsements to candidates. 
I've looked over hundreds of campaigns. I will give you a hint. The first thing I look at in speakers here at the college and at the Independent Builders of Illinois for an endorsement is do in fact the individual put together what I term a viable campaign. Meaning literature, stump speech, uh, buttons, what have you, coordinated things, uh, scheduling, things of that nature. Uh, if you put together a viable campaign, it shows to me that you're a serious candidate and a serious administrator. Because there's no formula for this. Some people even go out and hire consultants, what have you, because they're, they're not certain how to go about doing it. There's a lot of technicalities. IDI, as a matter of fact, offers classes for prospective candidates for office on how to do it. The Green Party is doing it their own. Matter of fact, my union is offering courses I was involved in because we want to run pro labor people for positions in office. But anyhow, take a look at your campaign and see if it's like a quote a viable campaign, whatever that may mean. And thirdly, if you want to do something for this community, the best thing to do is to remove weapons from it. If there are no guns, there will be no gun violence. It follows. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. If you're going to let individuals, self-appointed law enforcement people, that's not how we want to operate. It's on the cops. That's called vigilanteism. It's on the cops. No, and you have to remove the weaponry uh, from the community, and you will institute peace. But Charlie, you that know? would mean abolishing one of the Bill of Rights. In no, our it does not. No right is exercised in an absolute. Yeah. Uh -huh. And tell me the one that is. That's right to bear arms. Because apparently you're not a constitutional Free scholar. When you try to take someone's gun, they shoot you. No right is exercised in the absolute, and that's why there's all sorts of controls. Here's Children all. can't have guns and whatnot. There can be a hundred regulations on anything. Free speech is regulated. You can't yell fire in a crowded exactly. theater. Exactly. You cannot use fire in a hazardous or frivolous way or to cause harm to people. <laughs> Anyhow, you can't slander people. Oh, but I've got the right of free speech. What happened? Can you slander somebody? The, the lib libel law. No, yes, exactly. All right, thank you again, Josh, and good luck with your campaign. Come back um, one way or another. All right. All right. Let's All right. go. Happy New Year. Andy Anderson. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Andy Anderson. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, those of you that might not have been here before, uh, my brother and I run an information service out of Palatine. Uh, we translate or summarize large databases of information, a lot of those things in books. Basically, we condense books down to one-page cliff notes. For people that don't have time to read 10 or 20 books on a subject, on blacked-out subjects, you can get a briefing paper from us on uh, any number of things. Tonight, I would like to address some of the issues uh, that are plaguing the African-American com poor communities, especially as we were talking about. <coughs> There's a, the idea that the minimum wage job shouldn't be raised, I think, has been shown to be a cause for economic slavery in America. Today, a huge number of Americans, a huge number of people in the African-American community are working for minimum wage, adults. The inequality problem is enormous. Are any of you aware that there's a discrimination problem with the police? Does everybody think the police treat white and uh, African American people, Chinese, Caucasian, uh, whatever, fairly across the board? Is this a leading question? No, sir. Yeah. Let's have a show of hands. Who here thinks that the police uh, discriminate let's against do away with the voting? Yet, one one, one, one vote like at a time, Charlie. Yeah, we don't We're need, not going to put up with your heckling. We don't need voting. One vote at a time. Let's let's we'll democracy. just take a break. They're we'll racist. take a break until Charlie's it's through heckling. No, we don't okay. need voting. One vote at a time. Yeah, you're right. We don't need democracy, Charlie. <laughs> we don't need voting. You're right. Okay. Um, we'll the Democrats out. We don't vote the truth. If you're if you're going to be an honest person getting elected to office, you should uh, work with other people that are trying to do something about the massive discrimination across the board that we're seeing. 
There's health care discrimination between poor communities and better funded communities all across the board. There's, we still have a huge economic gap in this country, and it's grown since 1968 because of the idea that people that work hard for a 40-hour week job do not deserve to make a living. Today, the minimum wage, are, are any, anybody still listening? Uh, can you hear me out there at all? Yes. Yeah, I everybody hear just kind of tuned out? We're listening. The minimum wage today should be twenty-two fifty an hour Yay. in Chicago. <laughs> that, that's on a par with what it was in 1968 if it kept up with inflation. So this idea that minimum wage is only for people coming out of school and getting a starter job, that's 100% false. Now, I was young once. I was in my 30s once, and I, I believe some things that turned out to be totally false once I started reading and learning. So uh, there's a, a, a doctor in uh, Harvard Medical School. He tells all the incoming medical students, you have to keep an open mind your whole life because about 50% of what we teach you is going to turn out to be wrong in the future. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't know which half that is. So you, you can't just be settled in your beliefs. And <clears throat> George Bush, George W. Bush was praised, I think it was Stephen Colbert that did the roast. He said, I love this man. He has his opinion on Monday. He's absolutely certain it doesn't matter if the facts change by Wednesday. He sticks by his opinions. <laughs> Un well, who would have thought we'd have a president or somebody masquerading as the president that would make George Bush look intelligent? <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought it? Well, we live in a time where a third of the country is living in a bubble of mythology that's generated by Fox News. And uh, is anybody here not? Is, okay, let's have a show of hands. Who here knows about something called the Tuskegee Experiment? Okay. Well, who knows that the Tuskegee Experiment has been replaced by the hoax of the AIDS epidemic? Oh, God. Come on. Yeah. Nobody knows, right? Yeah, right. So Nobody AIDS knows. is a hoax? The HIV, there's books all over the world. The knowledge is out, it's coming up through the courts, just like the Tuskegee experiment. Yeah, well, HIV is too. known to be harmless. That's not the cause of what's making people sick. That's been proved all over the world. And African American community Where? here in Chicago and others are being targeted now by the pharmaceutical industry. They want you to sign up to take one pill a day to keep yourself safe, even if you're totally healthy. It's a multi-hundred billion dollar scam. It's just like learning that your priest has been abusing your kids for the last 12 years. It's a game changer. These are the kind of subjects, databases, that we translate. And if anybody wants any more information, that, uh, wants me to give a presentation at their uh, Rotary Club, school, church, whatever it is, uh, I'd be more than happy to. I give talks around the Chicago area on a variety of blacked out subjects. That's just one of them. And the other one, and this is the last thing I'll say, the other thing that's being blacked out right now by all the media is Russia, Russia, Russia messing with our elections. There is no coverage of the man called Greg Palast, who has published books on how right-wing criminals masquerading as Republicans are scrubbing the voter rolls right now of Democrats. If, George, if Trump isn't removed, it probably won't be possible to vote him out in 2020 because they won't allow enough Democrats to cast a ballot. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on in like 40 states, and state the media is not state. covering it at all. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andy. Okay, next. Hi there. I just wanted to do a couple of lightning round quick rebuttals to a number of things that I heard. One of the things that I think is disturbing and I think it reflects this sort of just uh, self-abasing intersectional just complete bullshit excuse my language which is this you know as a as a white non-disabled male I need to shut up and listen or something like that it's whoever wants to speak should speak and there shouldn't be any rules or guidelines on that the, the, this this it just bothers me anytime I hear people targeted like this person is too privileged, they can't speak, and this person's not privileged enough, they need to speak more. Like, let whoever wants to speak, speak. Let's not have any arbitrary kind of quotas about that. That bothers me, number one. 
Uh, number two, uh, corruption was mentioned a couple of times. I'm glad that uh, Joshua Flynn is going to be someone who's going to be a corruption hawk. Is what you know. If if I heard some of his comments correctly, then it sounds like he'll be a corruption hawk, uh, and that's good. And, and when it comes to corruption, you know, and, and how quickly and completely governments can get corrupt, I, I'm always kind of flabbergasted when you you, you get the whether it's on the right or the left, there's all kinds of big government groups out there, collectivist groups out there that say, oh, just this one extra program will fix this problem, just this one extra bureaucracy, task force, all this kind of stuff, eventually it'll get corrupted because power is concentrated in very few hands. So th this idea, if we're going to fight corruption, we can't be growing the state and the various apparatus and octopus squid arms of the state. We just can't be doing that. That's ridiculous. Um, when it comes to guns, um, them's fighting words. When someone says to me, and I'm not going to say whether I have guns or not, that's nobody else's business but my own, but when someone says to me, hey, uh, you should be disarmed, what I hear from them is, I want to make it easier for predators to do harm to you. Oh, yes. So yeah. that's what I hear, because that's the practical effect. So anytime somebody says, I'm going to take your guns, them's fighting words. Don't do that. Which is more important. Uh, your one bullet at a time. I'm up here right now. Uh, the term limit thing. You know, if I was going to be like super hardcore, pure libertarian, my response would be there should be no term limits. I should have the right to vote for whoever I want <coughs> as many subsequent times as I want. However, I can see a practical case being made that, you know, you can't let people get too comfortable in office too much. So when Charlie asks, well, when is it that a, a, a politician goes bad? Is there some kind of formula? Obviously, there's not a formula. Let's do a case by case to find out who gets bad when. Uh, but if, if Charlie is in, in, not in favor of term limits, then I'm sure he'll get right on the bandwagon to remove the constitutional term limits on president of the United States. Yeah. So that if yeah. Donald yeah. Trump wants yeah. to run for a third term, he can't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then finally, when it comes One to one bullet at a time, Charlie. And then finally, when yeah. it comes to the minimum wage and economic slavery, and it should be raised to twenty-two fifty an hour. I mean, I've been around these debates, uh, uh, the minimum wage debate, for a while. So I'll just, I'll go for the obvious one. Why twenty-two fifty? Why not 3250? Yeah. You know what? Yeah, that, that's not generous enough. enough. You know what? Uh, that's not generous enough. It should be 4250. Yeah. Right? 4250? It should be 4250. $42,500 per hour? I mean, as long as we can just pass a law that says you have to make this amount of money and therefore everything will be okay, well, Sixty-two dollars an hour. Let's yes, do. Let's 65. not a living wage, a thriving wage. Let's do a thriving wage. Sixty-two dollars an hour. Everybody gets sixty-two dollars an hour. Where's the line? How do you determine where the line is? Yeah, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that you're going to have somebody come up here and say the government should decide how much businesses can offer their potential employees and how much potential employees can decide for themselves to take. I don't want the government getting in between me and my employer, oh, no. or me and my employees, depending oh. on which position I happen to choose. It's not up to the government. I'm sorry. No, it's, if I'm going to go like oh, super hardcore hard. with it, it's freedom of association, right. not government can, can decide. You know, economic association. We're going to monkey with that. No, no, no. If I'm a business and I have freedom of association, I should be able to freely associate on the basis of $10 an hour if I choose, with any employee who's willing to take it. Freedom of association means I get to offer what I want, and the employee can decide to take what they want. And you can hire children. One full at a time. No, because they can't consent. And that's all I got, thanks. <laughs> OK. <laughs> hey, you can hire children. Yeah, I've heard a lot of talk hey, tonight. You're up there. <laughs> I've heard a lot of talk tonight about Donald Trump, and I just want to go on record to say it, that I think Donald Trump is a goddamn good president, yeah. and okay. I believe time will bear me out. All right, our last speaker. Well, I'll, right. I'll be as eclectic as usual this evening. Uh, Josh, I don't, I don't know if I missed it or not, but uh, did you mention the, the endorsement from U.S. term limits? Yes. Oh, okay. 
Uh, and we heard Fred Hampton uh, earlier. Uh, Josh has uh, started the Fred Hampton Caucus of the Libertarian Party. Amen. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, it was very... It, Josh came up here, he talked for a few minutes, and we went right into questions. At first it was kind of like, whoa, but then it, the, it provoked this conversation that we had uh, unfold this evening, and it, I, don't, I think that would have... We learned more about Josh than we probably would have done in, in, in a longer prepared speech. So this was a very awesome conversation. Josh nailed it tonight. Uh, so everybody give a hand for Josh for being yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's his birthday, so happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. about, you know, which kind of taxes you refer. I'm surprised Joe didn't mention land value tax. Uh, uh, Milton Friedman kind of gave it a, uh, you know, honor, you know, like a positive kind of highlight. So that might be something that people could look into. As far as LGBT uh, curriculum in school, I think that uh, people should learn in public schools how uh, LGBT folks have been discriminated against. Um, I think it's important that they learn about LGBT uh, uh, historical figures, uh, court cases, etc. Uh, it's good that Jonathan is back. Uh, I missed seeing John here. Uh, who else? Who else uh, is is happy to see Jonathan back? Jonathan for president. It's a vote, though. We we can't bridge the we can't bridge libertarians and democratic socialists. Uh, Amen. I uh, went to a meeting with uh, Andre Vasquez at his aldermanic office. Um, we we're, we could work together on anti-war matters. Right on. We can work together on anti locking up sex workers. Yes, yes. Anti uh, locking up uh, people for. Uh, Mom, what they consume Mom, in that. their body. Say that. Innocent people. Um, and even, I even floated this idea, he seemed to like it, DIY pothole repair. Uh, instead of waiting for the city to do it, if you just want to go to Home Depot with your neighbors and patch it up yourself, we should make, we should have, uh, make it easier for us to do that. Um, Jonathan also inspired, I think, my next college complex is talk, the good and bad of Noam Chomsky. There's a lot of good to say about Noam Chomsky, a lot of bad. Uh, so I think I'll I think I'll do that, and I'll start with that book you gave me. Uh, I, I cracked it a little bit. I didn't finish it, but uh, there's a documentary. Too. And I, I've seen the documentary uh, Record for American Dream. I, I still need to see the uh, manufacturer consent I, or read it. Uh, um, I also think I might. You know, even beyond that, maybe a good, bad Charlie Paydock presentation here at the college. Uh, <laughs> no, no, think of all that. Without, I, I don't, I, I don't understand Charlie's position on guns. He he doesn't think we should have guns, but without guns, how are you going to force people into socialism? How are you going to, how are you going to throw them into prison labor camps and? Uh, how are you gonna, you know, do all that sort of stuff if you take away the guns? I don't get it. Um, but thank you. That's all. All right, our speaker gets the one more. One more. All right, David. I wasn't planning to come up here again, but Charlie said that the uh, that no incumbent had ever been thrown out of office in Congress. Well, in 1994, Charlie, when the Democrats lost control of the House. Thomas Foley, the Speaker of the House, ran for re-election in his home district in Washington. And he lost to a Republican named George Nethercutt. That okay. was part of Newt Gingrich's well, little on. contract with America, or as some of us call it, the contract on America. Thank you. Thank that was you one of the best it. things that I've had. Correct. Speaker gets the last Thank word. You. you get the last word. Go up. You get the last word. Do you comment or not? Or what not? David. Give us your best reason why we should vote for you. You know, I forgot about it. Thank you.
Uh, I want to say thank you for having me out here tonight. Uh, I appreciate the time given to uh, talk about my campus and about my district, about my community, uh, and about myself as well. Um, why you should vote for me? Uh, I'm the candidate that's in Lower Texas. I'm the candidate that's going to have working people, so it'd be safer for you to come to my community and actually spend money in my community, because right now you're not. So now I'm breaking to my community so you can spend some money there. Um, and I can say I th thank you for having me out here tonight. I appreciate the time. Thank you. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. The College of Complex is now officially adjourned. We'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. And uh, again, a hand to Charlie Pater for keeping this place organized for so long. Yes. We stand adjourned. No gun. Let the go. Next week, if you make it. Yeah. 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 This is the iron. The iron man. Right? The iron man.